and we're back for another episode of the daily show guys it's really nice to see you again um live no not live recording here back here at my home studio and uh i think i'll be for the meantime i'll probably be recording um here at home for now um starting this month august by the way this episode is for august 3 tuesday and uh yeah that's that's pretty much uh my introduction i guess but as usual we're gonna have our uh, uh format and uh we'll start with the observances and then followed by the uh, today in history some notable figure and the uh, stuff of the day that we're gonna be talking about nothing changed basically except for the um recording area you know or the place where i record so you used to um, see Joe and I on my episode and his episode, but for now, I'm probably just going to go solo. Um, I think it's just because it's more relaxing for me to do this at home as uh, as of now, you know. Plus, after this, I just, you know, grab something to eat, pretty much. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, why don't we start with our show today? Uh, let's start with the observances. Alright, I wonder what the first one we have. Well... I really don't wonder because I'm the one who created the slides. Anyways, here's the first one we have, Clean Your Floors Day. Now, also known as National Clean Your Floors Day, just kind of add national to that. Today is the day where we are encouraged to make our house floors the cleanest it can be, you know? And speaking of floors, there are numbers of types of floors, you know, there's hardwood, there's vinyl, there's laminate, linoleum, uh, tile, uh, carpet. The one where my wife and I are currently living at uh, is a carpeted floor. So we use vacuum and uh, we try our best not to spill any liquids on the carpet because yeah, I'm going to say personally, carpets are one of the hardest floors to maintain when it comes to cleanliness. Yes, you vacuum them. Uh, or you va vacuum it, let's say once, twice a week, but there's still gonna be some, you know, dirt in between those uh, those fabrics, those, those um, uh, linings, you know. Um, hardwood would be the easiest for me, I think, because you just you can vacuum it, you can mop it, you you can do a lot of styles of cleaning. Um, Clean your floor day is dedicated to scrubbing mopping or even shampooing them you know like i said it's just going out I, I think it would be really expensive to shampoo uh carpet so you only do it like once in a while um and doing whatever else is necessary to get them clean um if you're unable uh to or if you're unable to do it yourself or if you do not have time to do so uh, you don't have to worry because there are actual professionals who can be hired to clean floors. Uh, they may also use industrial equipments, you know, um, something that is built to last compared to your daily cleaners or daily machines like, you know, like residential vacuum. They might have like a professional industrial one that actually is way stronger. Um, and solutions too, of course, solutions to make your floors not just clean, but also smelling really good. Uh, I think that's where shampooing is for, for carpet, you know. But a lot of these solutions, I'm sure they have uh, like the scent to make your floor smell good. Um, of course, cleaning one's own floors is probably the best way to celebrate. But uh, you don't have to do it solo, I'm just saying, you know, like if you have your friends, roommates, I mean, I guess if they're if they're okay with it, uh, your family members, you know, it's a good way to uh, spend time with them too. Um, having more people help you out could finish the task faster. Uh, yeah, so there you have it. Oh, uh, actually, by the way, if you're wondering about the picture, um, right, right, right there. I'm sorry, my camera is kind of mirrored. Um, if you notice the picture, um, it, it's not. It doesn't look like a typical cleaner, you know, um, because that is actually a robot vacuum cleaner, um, or what they call now these days smart cleaner, just like your 
your smartphones. Uh, I mean, there's smart fridge, there's a smart smart house system. And obviously, uh, at some point, we're going to have some sort of house or uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, um, smart cleaners. There you go. At some point. Uh, at that point is now. Um, speaking of which, the most famous brand, I believe, of a um, smart cleaner is called the Roomba. And they're quite expensive. Um, and I guess another reason why they're called smart cleaners is you can actually set them, like set them up into cleaning your floors, doing the vacuum um, thing automatically. Like you don't like you know for your traditional vacuum, what you do is you turn it on, and you you still have to kind of use it yourself, right? For for Roomba or those smart cleaners, you can actually schedule a cleaning time if you're away. It would, uh, it would it would. Uh, work by itself you know uh, given that it has enough charge and uh, yeah it no it could detect corners and stuff so it could turn left and right depending on on the uh, I forgot the I forgot what I, what I was gonna say depending on the well I guess the the, the flooring of your house pretty much so and since we're talking about floors, uh, why don't I ask you guys, and if you can answer me in the comment section below, what kind of floors do you currently have in your house, or in your home, or in your apartment? And again, replies are welcome in the comment section below. Then, maybe when you're done cleaning your floors, you can relax and enjoy the next observance. Now we're going to the next observance, and that is... The watermelon! Today is also watermelon day, especially this summer. I mean, it's very popular th this summer. If you see watermelon, the, for me, actually, if I see watermelon, the next thing I would think of would be the beach or the shore or summertime in general, right? So again, popular during summer, watermelon has over 1,200 varieties. Um, in the Western Hemisphere, it is grown in the United States, Mexico, Central America, particularly in Guatemala and Costa Rica, and South America. Um, more than 30 states in the United States grow watermelon. The leading ones would be Florida, Texas, California, where we are at right now, Georgia, and Indiana. I just want to point out what I said a while ago, having 1,200 varieties, you know, it's just... Uh, I mean, <laughs> for me, at least, obviously, I didn't see all 1,200 varieties, but so far, most of the, the, the watermelon that I, I've i observed or, or saw, uh, they kind of look the same. So, I don't know, if you, if you guys saw a different looking watermelon, let me know in the comment section below, too. Uh, I would really be interested, or you can contact me directly during Zoom. Maybe you can, you know, uh, show me a picture or something. Uh, watermelon is available all year round um, in the United States because of supply from south of the border. Um, watermelon is usually considered to be a fruit and eaten as one. I don't know why my script says usually considered to be a fruit because it is definitely a fruit, <laughs> right? But it can also be considered to be a vegetable. That is why. And eaten as such. Um, red and pink watermelons maybe the most common and that is i'm pretty sure that is the one that we all know and we all see the uh, at the grocery places um but it can also be white yellow and orange now i'm interested to see a uh, different color watermelon because i actually haven't seen any other types of watermelon aside from the red and the pink one uh it comes in various sizes with or without seeds but I prefer the one with, I don't know, seeds because I guess I just got used to eating watermelon and spit out the seeds, you know? Um, for those of you who don't prefer seeds, hey, guess what? There are seedless watermelon too, so that could be something you could enjoy. Um, after this, let's say you clean your floor, you got tired, uh, and uh, you want to take a break, uh, go grab or eat. Uh, slice of watermelon and or 
you might want to enjoy the third observance that we'll be talking about. Grab some nuts day. So if you're not in the mood of watermelon, maybe nuts, right? So next one, we'll talk about nuts. And they are often eaten as a snack, uh, being raw or roasted, and maybe plain, salted, or seasoned. Now, I'm going to ask you guys right now, before we talk more about um, nuts, is what, how, what is your favorite type of nut? Because it could be not a nut. <laughs> I, I think I sounded, that sounded weird. Whatever nut you are thinking of may not be a nut. That's what I'm trying to say. Hey, yes. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, <clears throat> nuts can be classified in a culinary sense and a botanical sense. You know, botanical nuts are those that are technically nuts, like scientifically nuts. Um, oh man, I'm gonna get nuts talking about nuts. <laughs> I, I hope you guys don't. Um, the shell of these nuts is hard and doesn't open to release the seed. Uh, some examples are hazelnuts, acorns, yes, acorns are nuts, and chestnuts. Uh, most seeds that we call nuts are just nuts in culinary sense. So we just, you know, we, we call them nuts, but scientifically, uh, they're not really nuts. Uh, this is a less restrictive term to identify nuts, where the criteria needed to be classified as botanical nuts is not met. So, culinary nuts are usually any edible, large, or oily kernel that grows in a shell. Here's the example, and you might be surprised again, but since you guys are joining us on Zoom, or for those of you who are joining um, us in our Zoom session, uh, for some of these, you won't, you won't be surprised anymore because we were doing trivia games, right? So, the examples are almonds, there you go, pistachios. There you go, cashews. Peanuts are not scientifically nuts. They're just botanically nuts. Or, I'm sorry, not botanically, but culinary. There you go, just for the sake of cooking. Uh, walnuts and pecan or pecans. There you go. So if you, uh, if you like any of those, don't worry. You can still eat them and treat them uh, as nuts for Grab Some Nuts Day. And those are our observances today. Um, I'm going to say we don't have any extra observances, so we're going to jump on straight to Today in History. All right, let's see what do we have in Today in History. There we go, 1958. The Nautilus uh, submarine travels under North Pole. So 1958, the U.S. nuclear submarine uh, Nautilus accomplishes the first undersea voyage to the geographic North Pole. The world's first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus dived at Point Barrow, Alaska and traveled nearly 1,000 miles under Arctic ice cap to reach the top of the world. It then steamed on to Iceland, pioneering a new and shorter route from the uh, Pacific to the Atlantic and Europe. So the USS Nautilus was constructed under the uh, direction of U.S. Navy Captain um, Hyman G. Rickover, a brilliant Russian-born engineer who joined the U.S. Atomic Program in 1946. In 1947, he was put in charge of the Navy's nuclear propulsion program and began work on an atomic submarine. Now, you, I mean, this one is talking about like a nuclear submarine, right? But if we talk about submarines in general, um, it, it, it became a very big help for us, especially to learn, discover more marine life. You know, we were able to go a little bit deeper um, underwater, under the sea, to be able to see what um, what other living marine creatures are out there, and we were able to also study study them. So I guess the um, I could say that the obviously the first purpose of a submarine is for military purposes, right? But at least the technology of a submarine can be 
also applied to science, especially marine biology, you know, and exploration. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool to, to, uh, to realize that now we are able to go uh, deeper under the sea to learn more about the ocean or the, the underwater in general. Even though we can't really go really, really deep yet closer to, uh, I guess, the deepest seafloor. Uh, I believe that's the uh, Mariana Trench. But now we could send um, unmanned equipments or unmanned, um, uh, I forget the term. Well, I guess unmanned submarine because technically it is a submarine. It's submerged, right? But there's nobody. There are no humans there. It's uh, being controlled via remote. So yeah, that's cool. All right. Next, we have the notable figure born today. We have Elisha Otis. Elisha Otis. He was born in, I believe it's pronounced Halifax. Halifax, Vermont. Um, he was... An American founder of the Otis Elevator Company and inventor of a safety device that prevents elevators from falling if the hoisting cable fails. Now, <clears throat> thanks to him, we have a convenient and safe way in going up and down the floors of a building. Though for me personally, I mean, I'm not hating elevators. I do prefer... Uh, I was gonna say I don't hate elevators it's just that I prefer personally escalators you know I, I guess it, it I mean it may have something to do with uh, kind of like being being inside a box or something I I'm not claustrophobic but like I said I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable using an elevator but if there's an escalator I would prefer it because it's more open plus uh, when you go and when you go to an escalator or on an escalator it also diagonally moves right it, it doesn't just go vertically it also goes horizontally it's like a like a ladder oh not a ladder a stairs it's like the stairs automatic stairs i believe that's what an escalator is uh for elevator is just basically going up and down um so with that said uh why don't you uh guys tell me which one do you prefer if you're moving from one floor to another, do you prefer an elevator or an escalator? There you go. And I know some of you guys are in a wheelchair definitely will pick the elevator because uh, that's also another great um, use of elevator, you know? So yeah, there you have it, guys. <laughs> that's our notable figure born today. Thank you, Mr. Elisha Otis, for um, inventing this very convenient and safe way to going from the first floor to the rooftop well not really rooftop um last floor before the rooftop yeah <laughs> all right now we're going to uh we'll talk about the place of the week and we'll talk about vietnam there we go oh my gosh we have our vietnamese students our vietnamese um co-workers staff i'm pretty sure you're gonna see this video so before anything else, I wanted to apologize if I won't be able to to pronounce the words properly, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best right there. <laughs> All right. So this is an episode for Tuesday, and uh, that means we're going to have to talk about the national symbols. And as far as the sports, I would rather talk about uh, the uh, traditional game, you know, that's like a game or a sport that a lot of people like common people play either in the street or or anywhere you know instead of the actual sports because what i notice every time i try to look for for national sport of a country a lot of them are football or soccer so and it, i don't want to keep like talking about hey it's soccer the next episode hey it's soccer or football so yeah all right, let's start with national animal. Does this animal look familiar? Uh, right there. It should because we just talked about this animal, um, I would say just a few weeks ago. And I actually used the same picture if, if, uh, if you guys didn't notice. All right, so Vietnam's national animal. Oh, actually the reason why they would look familiar because not just with talked about this but there's a reason because our 
my home country, the Philippines, also um, have this animal to be the national animal. And it's the water buffalo. Um, water buffaloes are important in Vietnam for the same reason as it's important to other Asian countries and the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they are huge helpers in farms. Yes, um, though since farming machines are becoming more common, um, us humans rely on water buffaloes less. Uh, but of course, there's still a lot of uh, not so developed areas in a lot of Asian countries, even in the Philippines, you know, we still use um, water buffaloes to help us in farming and I'm, I'm sure Vietnam is also doing the same thing. Um, what I'm just saying is that, you know, with these current technologies and inventions and machineries, um, water buffaloes are getting less and less involved with farming. But I think that's, uh, that's actually good, you know, because it's, I think it's about time that we let these gentle bovines just relax and enjoy their lives in the wild, you know, uh, have them retire or in, yeah, enjoy the farm saying well they watch the machines the actual machines do the farming thing you know they can just uh enjoy their mud spa oh mud mud spa there you go because that's what they like to do they like to uh, relax in the mud all right next is we have vietnam's uh national flower and it's the lotus flower now again this is something that we also talk about not just recently though, I would say uh, at least in one of our episodes, like a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, so the lotus flower is the national flower of Vietnam. And the what, what it symbolizes would be purity, commitment, and optimism for the future. Such a wonderful um, symbolization for a wonderful flower like this. Um, at night, the flower closes and sinks underwater and then rises and opens again at dawn. There you go. So, it's very awesome. Alright. Next would be... Uh, I guess we're going to this now. <laughs> Alright, so... Uh, the picture. The picture you guys can see is a picture of kids playing this um, traditional game. With a question mark, you know, a traditional game that a lot of kids play. Actually, this is a game for kids, and um, there might be something similar that you got that you may have played here, uh, because in our country we also have something similar um, as as far as the concept is concerned for this game. And I'm gonna try now to pronounce it. Uh, I did ask some of our Vietnamese staff uh, friends how you know like how to pronounce it um they were tell they were teaching me how but you know me i tend to mispronounce even even english words like like right now i did so uh i guess good luck good luck to me all right so the name of this game is long lan lan mai just let that sink in <laughs> right there that's the name i'll, I'll try to say it again Long, ah, I think I failed. Let me do it again. Long, lan, lan, mai. So, um, I guess enough, enough of uh, pronouncing the word because I'm not obviously I'm not really good at that. But the name of the game uh, translates to dragon and snake fly into the sky. Um, the way it's played, uh, you guys can see the picture. You'll have a group of players forming a line, um, which is kind of like on the right side, right? And then you'll have a player separate, separated from the line, uh, right there on the on the left side. So that solo player that you're seeing will attempt to grab the line's tail, which is the last person and the line, the the kid wearing green at the very back, right there, um, while the person in front of the line which is the kid wearing a uh, navy blue with a shade of sky blue with the blue shorts or blue shirt blue shorts right there um, his job is he's supposed to stop the solo kid into grabbing the last kid or the tail of the uh, line right there now i'm saying line because 
I didn't have enough time to research which one is the dragon or which one is the snake and if you know a little bit of Asian mythology, the uh, Asian version of, of a dragon kind of resembles a snake too because like um, in other countries, other places, other continents, when, when you say dragon, it has, it, it's more of a like, it, it could stand up, right? But for, uh, well, I guess all dragons can stand up. What I'm trying to say is like, it looks like a, more like a uh, lizard. Right there, more like a lizard. But for the Asian countries, they look more of a snake. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's why I'm not sure which side is the dragon and which side is the snake. But I can definitely tell you guys it's a fun game because like I said, uh, we have a similar, we have a game with, uh, with a similar concept in my home country. And uh, it, it's a, it's a fun game basically you know it's re it's very tiring if you're really being serious and playing it uh, but yeah it's generally fun uh, what about you guys so I wonder if you guys have played something similar to this or at least the concept you know there's gonna be a line and then uh, you're, there's gonna be an it you know and that it or that solo person will be trying to to uh, get the person at the back of the line or something yeah and again, let me know in the comment section below, guys. Alright, so time for our stuff of the day. Stuff of the day, Disney animals. <laughs> I'm sorry, I burped. <laughs> there we go. Animal of the day, we have Dory. Not Dory in Discovery, uh, but Dory in uh, Finding Nemo, or even Finding Dory. Uh, she has her own movie. Um, but... <clears throat> Dory is actually based on a true type of fish called the blue tang. Uh, if you guys are paying attention to the picture, uh, the one on your left is Dory and the one on your right is a real blue tang. And you can literally see the resemblance minus the, um, minus the eyes because Dory's eyes, since she's an animated character, you know, it's bigger. And the blue tang's eyes are... Are, are that <laughs> so the blue tan fish is rather a cute little fish it can usually be found in the uh, tropical reefs of the indo-pacific a vast stretch of water that includes the uh, tropical parts of the indian and pacific ocean uh, the blue tang fish can grow to a quite a decent size i'd say uh, with a, uh, adults typically measuring up to a foot or 12 inches long and weighing up to 21 ounce now you might be wondering right because if you see the movie you would notice that dory even the finding nemo uh dory has a quite a you know like a some sort of a three second memory where after three seconds she would forget the last thing that happened well there's no scientific proof in real life that blue tanks only retain a three second memory so, which was portrayed there in the movie. So just just so you're wondering, uh, do blue tanks are are blue tanks actually forgetful? Well, there's no scientific evidence. So obviously in the movie they just added it there to come up with a plot, right? With with the story of the movie. Um. Anyways, I still have I also still have a few more, mm, few more um interesting facts about blue tanks. Um, here are some of the interesting ones that you may not know. Blue tanks are capable of adjusting the intensity of their color, hue, from light blue to deep purple. And again, that is for uh, cam camouflage uh, purpose or trying to intimidate their predator. The blue tank possesses a sharp spine or modified scale. These spines may be made to stand erect, providing the blue tang with an effective means of self-defense now speaking of protection in case you know the the spine fails to pro uh, protect the uh, blue tang uh, well guess what the flesh of the blue tang is poisonous so even if the predators successfully hunt a blue tang well i don't think they're gonna be enjoying their meal <laughs> there you go so next we have the plan of the day uh, something that blooms in summer or very famous in summer um, if you think about watermelon i think we already talked about watermelon a couple of uh 
couple of episodes ago. So I'll go with the balloon flower. And the balloon flower is a clump forming perennial flower, a member of the easy to grow bellflower family of plants. They are named because of their puffy balloon like buds, which swell up to uh, two to three inch. Um, the picture you're seeing right now is already blooming. Um, but if you guys pay attention more about the uh, uh, the background right there's a well it's kind of like something blurry like for example the one on the left side of this blooming flower you can see that it's kind of look like a balloon right balloon flowers are very easy to grow uh, but tall plants may need uh, cutting or staking to keep them staking stalking to keep them from flopping um, blooming all summer long it is an excellent plant for border gardens or rock gardens and it freely self seeds in the garden so if you guys like doing some uh, garden activities maybe you can consider the balloon flower next up we have the musical artist of the day now here's the thing since we're talking about um, we're showcasing a song and our topic is based on an artist per month, I might as well call it musical artist of the day instead of just musical art. Technically, music is an art, so we still have, uh, we're still talking about an art. And for this month's musical artist of the day, I guess I just shut, I, I should just put month of the month, but we go per day. We got Whitney Houston. And first, we're gonna be talking about one of her famous songs, I Wanna Dance with Somebody. 1987 yeah so you we're listening to it on exercise time right so this song is a song recorded for her second studio album Whitney named after herself 1987 um, it was released as the album's lead single by Arista Records it was produced by Narada Michael Walden and written by George Merrill and Shannon Rubicam um, of the band Boy Meets Girl, who had previously collaborated with Houston on the song How Will I Know. Yeah, by the way, those both songs, I love it. Just saying. This song received mixed reviews from music critics. Uh, some of them praised Houston's vocal performance, but critiqued its musical arrangement, comparing it to How Will I Know and Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Despite the mixed critical response though, um, the song became a worldwide success, topping the charts in 18 countries including Australia, Italy, Germany, and the UK. Now here in the US, it became Houston's four consecutive chart topper and is certified three-time platinum with sales of over 3 million copies. So by the... Come on, you should have heard of this song. Very awesome song, very lively, upbeat, uh, perfect for exercising, you know? At the 30th Annual Grammy Awards, I Wanna Dance With Somebody won for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance, marking Houston's second win in the category. There you go. All right, now word of the day, since we are in August, that means a, I have to showcase a word that is eight letters. An eight letter word. And for today's eight letter word, we have abdicate. There you go. It's abdicate. Let me spell it for you. A, B, D, I, C, A, T, E. It is a verb and it means of a monarch, renounce one's throne or to fail or full or fail to fulfill or fulfill <laughs> fail to fulfill or undertake a responsibility or duty so uh, it's more of a monarchy word you know royal word you know, so for kings and queens and and dukes and uh, prince and princesses uh, that is abdicate all right, our last part of today's show, guys, we have the tech trivia. Did you guys know that the QWERTY style, it's called QWERTY because if you guys are paying attention to the keyboard, I'm always getting confused. Right there, right there. Um, 
beside the uh, tab key on the left you guys see the uh, the letter q w e r t y being together that that's why it's called the qwerty style keyboard did you guys know it actually uh was um developed or made initially to slow typing down yes um if you would think that this style is actually to make typing faster well I guess now <laughs> but back in the day it was actually meant to type to do the typing uh, be slowed down you know um, that is because when typewriters were introduced typing too quickly would jam the keys and you gotta remember before the computer there were typewriters and those taka 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 taka, like like the noisy ones and if you make a mistake you can't even you can't even replace it or or uh, erase it clean. <laughs> you can't even erase it clean. You have to like get another piece of paper, you know. So to prevent this from happening, the QWERTY keyboard or QWERTY style keyboard was introduced, which placed common alphabets at a distance from each other and slowed typists down. Of course, at that time, that format, uh, that format was new so people are not familiar and of course that did affect their typing speed but by now come on typing this uh, i mean typing using this keyboard this qwerty format uh, come on for me easy peasy i may not be the fastest typist or typer or person that is typing <laughs> you know in the world but i could i could you know uh <clears throat> fairly stand my ground into uh, the world of typing speed and that is because I've got used to the QWERTY keyboard now, or QWERTY stop keyboard. Now, if I use a different format, obviously I'm gonna slow down, like significantly, because uh, you know my my fingers, I have the uh, my finger memory on where the keys are, so I can type without looking. But change the format, uh, I'm gonna have to start over again. I just say. <laughs> Alrighty, guys, and that is the end of our show today. Uh, hope you like it. Hope you learned something new. As usual, don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. I really appreciate any uh, any comments that you can leave. Thank you. As long as it's about the topic that we're talking per episode. Thank you so much, guys. And again, I guess thank you for uh, still watching our episodes. We are really grateful. Um, we're not really looking for more views and all as long as you guys could learn something from it um i think it's that's actually more than enough for us but technically if you learn something from it that means you watch the video <laughs> so i don't know what i'm saying it's kind of hard to actually do solo right now because i'm used to having conversation with like let's say joe or ian but i guess i'm gonna i'm gonna get used to it plus i'm talking to you guys so i would really love to hear or to see your replies in the comment section below um, for today though, I'm gonna have to say goodbye, signing out, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Yes. I mean for my episode. Bye.